أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين وهو خير ناصر ومعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد my respected elders my dearest brothers and sisters in Iman السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته in the previous lecture, we were talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's test and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has installed inbuilt filters within his testing scheme to filter out those people who accept the truth for worldly purposes in out of greed for the good and the material gain of this dunya and those people who accept the truth for its own merits and out of a sincere desire to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and earn his ridwan, his pleasure and his satisfaction. When Imam al-Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam was proceeding on his journey to Karbala, he issued a statement that really beautifully highlights what we were discussing in the previous lecture. And I feel it's definitely worthy of reflection and deep uh, pondering. As he's setting out on this journey and proceeding towards Karbala, he issues a statement saying, in the Nasa, this is, this is his observation. And it is a very accurate and methodical observation. He says, in the Nasa, Abidu Dunya, wa dinu laqun bi ala al sinatim. يَحُوطُونَهُ مَا دَرَّتْ مَعَائِشُهُمْ فَإِذَا مُحِصُوا بِالْبَلَاءِ قَلَّ الدَّيَّانُ He says people in general, human beings, are worshippers of this dunya. They worry about the dunya. For them, their God is dunya, in a sense. They are subservient and they submit to the dunya. وَالدِّينُ لَعْقٌ عَلَىٰ أَلْسِنَتِهِمْ the religion is just some kind of showpiece that you see rotating and revolving on their tongues. So religion is just, for many religious people, they are actually in it for the dunya. So they may talk a lot of religion, you may hear a lot of you know, religion coming out of their mouths, but their actual motive is worldly greatness and worldly glory. So they continue to recite the tasbih of deen. They continue to repeat, you know, and talk about deen and deen and deen and religion. As long as talking about it and focusing on it, as long as it's bringing the big bucks, they will support religion. They will talk about religion. They will even, even promote religion. And they will show that they are fully loyal to the religion. But then the Imam says, فَإِذَا مُحِصُوا بِالْبَلَاءِ قَلَّ الدَّيَّانُونَ It is only when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the test, the test that is designed to filter out those who are sincere in their intentions and those who are insincere. Imam says, when the test from Allah comes, قَلَّ الدَّيَّانُونَ The religious people become very few. Their numbers dwindle. So this is a very interesting observation that he makes is that the truly, truly religious people, people who are in it for the sake of Allah, such people are always few and far between. Majority of people, wherever you see the crowd, the crowd is always after the dunya and they're worshipping the dunya. Even when the crowd practices religion, a lot of the time, majority of people are doing it out of worldly reasons. So some of you might think, well, this is a very cynical way of looking at the world, but the reality is this is human nature. This is a weakness that is ingrained within human beings and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not ingrained it in such a way that you cannot come out of it. No, that is the whole test, is that you have to come out of it. So, but this weakness is intrinsic to human nature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Adiyat, he says, when he talks about the human being, he says, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لِرَبِّهِ لَكَنُودٍ وَإِنَّهُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ لَشَهِيدٍ وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ Lashadid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes three observations here about the human condition and the human being. He says, Inna al-insana li rabbihi lakanud. 
The first thing is the human being is very ungrateful in the face of the favors of his Lord. He is ungrateful and thankless. Number one. Number two, وَإِنَّهُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ لَشَهِيدٌ He's also a witness to this fact. Allah says this is not just a claim that I'm making on my part. If you introspect, if you consider how much I have given you and how much you have thanked me for what I have given you, you will understand that what I'm telling about you, your condition and your psychology is actually very, very true. You are indeed very ungrateful and you are indeed very thankless. There are so many Ni'am and so many favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that people enjoy and take completely for granted. It never even occurs to us because of how easily and freely accessible Allah has made those favors to us. We don't even realize their value until it's taken away from us. In the current circumstances, we can see in this country itself, with the number of corona cases rising like anything, and COVID 19 really. Um, taking control of this country in a way. There are so many people suffering from this and they need oxygen. There are hospitals complaining that they have run short of oxygen supply. And so there is this real state of chaos whereby people are desperate for oxygen and they are unable to receive it on time sometimes because of the paucity of the arrangements that have been made uh, with regard to this. So this oxygen, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made so freely available to us previously, and for which he has created an entire system within the body that deals with it. How many times do we actually think of thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the air that we breathe and for making it free for us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't charge us anything for the oxygen he gives us. And yet, as human beings, we never even think about it. These are favors of Allah that we take completely for granted. Until they're taken away from us, that is when we begin to realize their value and appreciate what a great favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, Allah had bestowed us with all along. And we didn't really realize and appreciate its value until it has now been taken away from us or it, is, it has become much more difficult to access and avail. So in any case, the first point Allah is saying, even you as a human being, if you introspect, you will yourself testify that I am correct and I'm truthful when I say the human being is ungrateful to his Lord and to his creator. And the third thing that Allah says is وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٌ The human being has a great deal of love for the good of this world, whether it be money, wealth, status, power, glory, fame, all of the worldly uh, attachments, human being has a weak point for them. And ultimately, in the test of the life of this world, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see, is that how many people can rise above their slavery to the dunya and connect with him and make him the focus and goal of their existence? And how many people will say no to that and will not want to adopt, adopt that path? Ultimately, this test is about looking at who are the worshippers of dunya and who are those who actively seek the hereafter and the pleasure and ridwan and reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which he has himself preferred for his slaves in the hereafter. That is what Allah is testing here. And that's why Imam al Hussein alayhi salam's statement that people are worshippers of this dunya and a lot of the time all the talk about religion, religion and deen is just a, a facade. It's a pretext to get more of the good things of this dunya. You can see the, the practical demonstration or the practical reality of this fact from the event of Karbala itself. So, how many people, how many Muslims at the time of Imam Hussein al Islam? They numbered in the thousands. Yet, how many came to his aid? How many came to support him in his mission? Very few. Even the people of Kufa who initially were inviting him, and they actually used the phrase Ajil bil Qudum. They said, Ya Imam, hasten, don't waste any time, come here as soon as possible. 
the very people who invited him and asked him to rush to Kufa. When the equation and the power equations changed and Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he captures uh, Kufa and he takes control of the government, the very people who are saying Ajil Ajil, they are on the back foot now. They retreat and they withdraw and there is no sign of them. They disappear. Why? Because the equation has changed now. There is no longer a strong worldly interest. In fact, there is great risk of worldly harm in supporting Imam al Hussein now. So they turn away from him. And this is why we say that, uh, generally speaking, in history it has been observed that those people who are always very anxious for something, when Allah finally gives that, that thing to them, then they don't uh, behave in the desired manner. So you find, for example, in our communities today also, so many prayers and so many people asking Allah to hasten the faraj. But the reality is, if any lesson is to be learned from history, the lesson of history is that the very people on whose tongues you hear the ajil the most, it is these very people who then, when the truth actually emerges, and when the truth actually comes, they are the first to run away and turn away from supporting and defending the truth when it needs to be supported and defended. So, it's just like the Jews in Medina. Allah says, وَكَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ يَسْتَفْتِحُونَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Before the Holy Prophet emerged, these people were begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for victory against the kuffar. They were like, we're living in the midst of all these kuffar. Ya Allah, make an opening for us. You know, make the truth triumph in this land. So Allah says, before the Prophet came, they were pleading with us, they were begging us. And then what happened? When we sent the messenger, فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ مَا عَرَفُوا كَفَرُوا بِهِ فَلَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ فَلَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the truth came to them, and when that which they recognized came to them, كَفَرُوا بِهِ They rejected it. And they were praying for it. But when Rasulullah came, they rejected him. Why? Because... The mission of the Holy Prophet did not align well with their worldly material interests. And that's why once they realized that the presence of the Prophet and his mission is a threat to their financial and worldly political interests, they immediately became his staunchest enemies. They, become, they became fierce enemies of the Holy Prophet. And they made every attempt. They left no stone unturned to oppose the Holy Prophet and to undermine his government in Medina. So what happened? Yeah, the dunya happened. The simple answer is dunya happened. Dunya is, in that sense, it is a very dangerous and powerful weapon of shaitan. And that's why Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi used to say, Hubbu dunya ra'su kulli khati. He says, the love of this world is the key. It is the foundation of every sin and every act of rebellion and defiance against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The love of the dunya is at the root of every disobedience and every sin. So if we're able to conquer and subdue and suppress hubbu dunya, that is the ultimate khair. And Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salatu wasalam, for those of you reciting dua Abi Hamza Thumari during the nights, you will notice that in this dua, he really begs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pleads with him that Sayyidi akhrij hubba dunya min qalbi. He says, oh my master, purify my heart of love for this world. Remove the love of this world from my heart. Because the love of the world is something that can make you go crazy. It's something that can make you do things that even people would consider inconceivable for a person of your level. Especially as far as religious people are concerned, sometimes even at the level of religious scholarship, for example. That's why you'll find repeatedly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appeals to the ulama. The ulama, as Ayatollah Shirazi stated in one of his lectures when he was lecturing the students in the Hawza, he said for the ulama and for the people of deen, the biggest fitna is fitna tul mal, the fitna of money and the fitna of wealth. It sounds strange and surprising, but this is something that the ulama themselves acknowledge and admit is that even after you reach a very high station in knowledge, the fitna of mal is such that it can be your undoing. And we have really scary examples from our own history. 
So for example, if you look at the history of the Waqifiya sect, this is a subsect within the Shia. They're called the Waqifa. Why are they called the Waqifa from Waqf? Waqf, for those of you familiar with the science of Tajweed, Waqf, Lazim, Waqf, Jaiz. Waqf means to stop. So why were they called Waqifa? They were called Waqifa because they stopped. What do you mean they stopped? They stopped at Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim salam. They did not accept and submit to the authority of Imam Ali bin Musa al-Rida alayhi salam after Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam. Why would they do such a thing? They are Shia. And they, no, they're not just Shia. They are some of the, the founders of the Waqifa sect. People like Ali ibn Abi Hamza al-Bata'ini and Ziyad bin Marwan al-Qandi and Uthman bin Isa al-Ru'asi. These were some of the most learned companions of Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Kadhim In fact, Imam al-Kadhim had chosen them because of their outward taqwa and their knowledge and their deep insight into the teachings of the Al Muhammad. Imam al-Kadhim had handpicked them to be his wukala, to be his representatives. When he went to prison, it was these great and massively learned companions who were the authorities of the time and who were representing the Imam and they were collecting funds in the name of the Imam. And they amassed a lot of wealth in the name of the Imam. And they were the and the Shia had great trust in them because they were the most learned companions of Imam al Sadiq and Imam al Kadhim. Their station in fiqh is such that even today, Despite the fact that their crimes are well documented in the books of history and Rijal and Hadith, still you find the books of Hadith are full of their narrations. And even the ulama and maraji' they use the narration, narrations of these companions in abwab of fiqh. So why do they, why do, they do that? You will see. In, I'll explain to you in a moment why, why they do that. But the important thing is that these companions of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq and Imam Musa al-Kadhim al-Islam who are so massively learned and who were considered initially trustworthy even by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt themselves. And this obviously again is evidence and proof that Imams don't have Ilm al they don't have knowledge and insight into everything. Otherwise the Imams would have never chosen these people as their wukala if they had known what they would do in the future. But the Imam chooses them because at the time he chose them to be his representatives there were people of great piety, people of great taqwa, people of great level of worship and ibadah on the face of it. But internally, their inner hypocrisy and their inner reality, we will not say that they were hypocrites right from the beginning. No, it's possible that in the beginning they, that they were sincere, but this dunya is such a dangerous and deadly weapon of shaitan that even after you have reached a high level of iman, this dunya can be your undoing. So what happened? As the classical Shia scholars will tell you, that the first people to introduce the belief of the Waqifa were Ali ibn Abi Hamza al-Bata'ini, Ziyad ibn Marwan al-Qandi, Uthman bin Isa al-Ru'asi. These are the top companions of Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Kadhim So then how did they go astray? And what happened? What happened was that after the martyrdom of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim after he leaves this world, Imam al-Rida alayhi salam becomes the leader of the Banu Hashim and he assumes the office of his father and in his capacity as the successor of his father he demands from the financial representatives of his father to surrender all the funds that they had collected in the name of the Ahlul Bayt in the name of the, their father the Imam al-Rida alayhi salam orders them to submit and surrender those funds to him because he's going to administer them and manage them now. The only reason why Imam al-Kadhim had asked them to administer the funds in his name was because he was in prison. So now that the next Imam is not in prison, he says, surrender the funds to me. And you know what's the response of these top companions of Imam Sadiq These fuqaha, these, they were the maraji of the Shia in the time of Imam al-Kadhim The Shia used to turn to them and they had authority of the Imam. So Imam al-Kadhim himself had appointed them as his financial representatives. 
because on the outward, you know, outwardly, they seem like decent, trustworthy, honest people and people who had a very great, uh, very deep uh, position in as far as knowledge was concerned. But then what happened? When Imam Rada writes to them this letter and he says, surrender the funds to me, they say, well, how can there be any question of surrendering funds to you when your father is, you know, he's still alive. Who told you he, is, he has died? So can you imagine, they deny the death of Imam Musa al-Qadim And then when the Imam al-Rada insists, he says, no, my father has left this world. We have divided his inheritance. So they say, no, 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 you are not aware. Your father has not died. He's very much alive and he has, you know, he has instructed us to continue collecting funds in his name. So why are they denying the death of Imam Musa al-Qadim In fact, a group among them, they claim that he has gone into Ghaiba for security reasons because he fears the Abbasids. He has gone into Ghaiba. But from the Ghaiba, we are in touch with him and he is continually issuing us commands and he's telling us to continue collecting funds in his name. This whole drama, why did they put up? They put this up because they did not want to surrender the funds that they had amassed in the names of the Ahlul Bayt. They did not want to surrender those funds to the next Imam. And that's why they came up with all kinds of lies. In fact, they ended up inventing a whole new subsect within the Shia because they then used their power and influence within the community. Remember, these were the top maraja during the time of Imam al-Kadhim when he's in prison, the community turns to these people. These are the active representatives. So using the power and influence that they had in their capacity as representatives of the Imam, they then, they then tell the Shia to not accept the Imama of the 8th Imam and instead they argue that the Imama of a minor brother of the Imam and in, in another case they alleged and argued for the Imama of another man from the tribe of Banu Asad. They said he's the Imam al-Kadhim would want him to be the Imam. And as far as Imam al Islam is concerned, when he insists that his father has left and he collects the testimonies, that he is no more in this world and he sends those testimonies. Obviously, they are mutawatir testimonies, so even these companions cannot deny them. So eventually, finally, they say, okay, we can accept that, that he has died and he has left this world. But even if that is the case, he gave us no instructions to pass on the wealth to you. So we are going to just keep it to ourselves. Even though any sincere person would know that the Imam doesn't even have to say that you have to. This is, this is natural law. This is logic. After the father, the son will succeed and he is more entitled than anyone else to administer the offices of his father because of his knowledge, because of his taqwa and because of his great merits. But in any case, these nuwab and these representatives, they do not surrender the funds. In, in fact, they invent all kinds of lies that he has gone into ghaiba or he has, you know, he has asked for the imama to be transferred to one of his minor sons. They invent all kinds of webs. And unfortunately, a lot of the Shia of the time who are not critical thinkers and who just go by the big names and they go by status and reputation and the fact that these are famous representatives and nuwab of the imams, they get deceived as a result. And they then continue to follow these uh, deviant ringleaders of the Waqifah sect and a, a whole sect, a rival sect gets established and it continues for quite some time. And then they also try to pull other people towards them. So there is a narration, for example, from Yunus of Abdul Rahman, in which he talks about how when Imam al-Kadhim left this world, these uh, companions of Imam al-Kadhim, they tried to buy him and win him over to their side. And he says it was all tam'an fil amwal. They were greedy for wealth. So and he even gives the amount of wealth. He says Ziyad ibn Marwan al-Qandi, for example, had 70,000 gold coins that he had collected in the name of the Imam. Ali ibn Abi Hamza al-Bata'ani had 30,000 uh, gold coins. Uh, similarly, Ali uh, Isa, uh, uh, Uthman ibn Isa al-Ru'asi, he also had a large amount of wealth. And that's why... The cause of their deviation has been identified as tama'u fid dunya. They were greedy for the dunya. Wa malu ila hutamiha. 
واستمالوا قوما فبذلوا لهم شيئا مما اختاروه من الأموال And then they used the wealth that they had to buy people and win over support to their side and to their cause. So you can see how. And these scholars, as I told you, until this very day in the Abwab of Fiqh, the scholars in Maraja, in many instances, they rely on the narrations of these deviant and corrupt financial representatives. And the reason they do that, they, it's actually, it's not that they, they're not familiar that these are corrupt agents. But their reasoning is that they say these corrupt agents have narrated so many hadith and narrations from the imams and their hadith and narrations are so valuable in the abwab of fiqh. In some abwab of fiqh, you don't have any narration except from these people because they had really encompassed all the ulum and knowledge of al-Muhammad. They were the top students of Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Kazim and that is why no one knew the fiqh of Imam al-Sadiq better than them. So that's why even to this very day, Shia scholars have no option but to even though they recognize that these companions are deviant, but they say if we remove, if we cancel out their narrations, then we don't have enough to build a fiqh. So they have, and then they, they, they make the argument that, well, we will not accept their narrations pertaining to their deviation. So all the narrations that these people then fabricated and attributed the imams about in support of their deviant belief of waqf, the scholars say we will not accept those narrations. But every narration that, that is simply about salah or zakah or fiqh, uh, that we don't see any harm in accepting. So in any case, it just goes to show you the towering station of these companions. that so they had memorized so much knowledge and they had internalized so much knowledge from the teachers from among the Imams of Ahlul Bayt that even after they deviated, the Shia could not uh, do away with their narrations. You still, they still rely on their narrations in many abwab of fiqh. So, because for example, Ali ibn Abi Hamza al-Bata'ini, who is the ringleader of the Waqifa, as Sayyid al-Khui points out in his Mu'jam, he says at least 545 critical narrations in the abwab of fiqh, uh, you know, we have to rely on him because no one else communicated and transmitted the verdicts and the positions of Imam Sadiq on those issues as well as Ali ibn Abi Hamza al-Bata'ini. So that goes to show you that sometimes even knowledge does not give you immunity. Even despite having great insight into the ulum of al-Muhammad and despite being such high-level scholars and maraja of their community, when it came to the fitna of mal, they failed the test. When it came to hubb dunya they gave precedence to their love of this dunya over and above their obligations and their fiduciary responsibilities in their capacity as the financial representatives of Imam al kazim alayhi salatu wasalam. So from all of this, we can see the great temptation and the great degree of fitna that is associated with this dunya this dunya can sometimes get the better of people that you would have normally thought it would not be able to get the better of. But this is the nature of this dunya and that is why constantly sometimes people ask why does Allah require us to pray salah five times a day? And in those five times a day salah, in the daily salah, at least twice in every two rak'ah you have to, twice in every prayer you have to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Why? Because when you are asking Allah for guidance, you are asking Him for guidance and you are asking Him to maintain you on the path of guidance. This is something, this is a dua that needs to be renewed each and every single day because you don't know what day shaitan might get the better of you. So that's, that is the whole reason why we need constant reconnecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Constantly we need to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek His guidance, seek His help, and seek his succor when it comes to uh, remaining on, on the straight path. So every salah you need to repeat this, Ehdina Salat al-Mustaqim. Because once you read history, once you read the examples that Allah gives you in the Quran of how people sold their akhirah for their dunya, that is when you realize that the fitna and the test of this dunya is a very difficult test. It's not as simple and easy as it may seem to you. And you are in constant need of help and support and tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
to remain firmly entrenched on the straight path. Otherwise, the storms and the tempests and the trials and tribulations and adversities of this dunya and sometimes the pleasures it offers you are such that they can shake you and they can cause your feet to slip even if you are a heavyweight person who has great insight into the religion and into the deen you are never Im immune from the attacks of the dunya and that is why the imams of Ahlul Bayt teach us in their du'as to really beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and plead with him to protect us from the fitna of the dunya so that we emerge and we come out of this test not having been fooled and deceived by this dunya because ultimately even in the quran when allah talks about people who will go to the fire of hell people who will fail the test in many instances instances you see allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he gives the spiritual diagnosis for such people he says dunya. the life of this world deceived them and that is why they failed the test so we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to protect ourselves from the assaults of the forces of this dunya so that we may pass this test and so that we may survive this test unscathed by the assaults and attacks that shaitan will make against us using the dunya as his weapon. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنْ يُحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَ